So this morning, as we come to the Word, I want to preach this morning about the bread of life. You know, bread's wonderful stuff. It, if you've got it just exactly, oh, I've got a bit of trouble. Um, if you've got just exactly the right sort of bread that you like, it just fills up the corners nicely, doesn't it? it? Makes you feel, oh yeah, I'm full now. It's very satisfying. You know, on YouTube, there's a whole weird satisfying meme you can get videos about things that are weirdly satisfying uh, you know from scrunching play-doh to popping bubble wrap and putting colored water putting a col food coloring into water and watching it all blend and just weird silly stuff like that and so because of that my uh, little great grandson Elijah that you've heard much of and you're going to hear more of um, he came over to my house uh, a couple of weeks ago and we were cooking pikelets and you know, he got his chair and sat up at the kitchen bench and he did all, measured in all the ingredients and he held the mixer and we mixed up the pikelets. And so I put the thing on the stove and it was getting hotter and I pour, I was, he's not allowed to do this bit, but I was pouring the batter in the spoonfuls into the pan. And you know what happens with pikelets? In a, in a moment, the, the little bubbles start to come up and that's how you know when to turn them over, when the bubbles have popped in the middle of the batter. And so the bubbles were coming up and he was leaning over much too close. He said, why is this so satisfying? <laughs> I think he found it much more satisfying to eat the pikelets out of the pan later, but satisfying is a whole thing. And YouTube, with its usual expertise, has found a niche in the market because it's our lack of satisfaction. And it sounds pretty crazy, really, because we're an affluent society, you know. Why do we need bubbles coming up out of pikelets? But satisfaction in life and living comes in all corners. And achievement in all sorts of things is very satisfying. Achievement in making nice food and eating it with family and friends or, or making our homes nice or doing our work well or achieving in sport. Those things are all very satisfying. And yet, it doesn't ever really seem to last, does it? It's all just for a time. We're never really fully satisfied. And advertising all over the place tells us that our next purchase is going to do the trick. And so we have a go at it, we try, but that stuff never really works. We strive and we stretch and we're really quite unfulfilled. And there are ambitions that are unfulfilled and there's never-ending complaining wherever we look. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Let's pray. And Father, we do offer our ears and our spirits and our hearts to you this morning to fill up because you're the bread of life. And we ask you to help us hear what you would have us hear in these words today. In Jesus' name. Um, we're going to be looking at the Gospel of John today and Jesus made seven I am statements in the Gospel of John and he did it in word picture form to explain to us who he is to us and who he is to the, wor to the world and the bread of life one comes first and it's the most lengthy and today I want to stick with that first one and to talk through much of the story of John chapter 6. And I want to try to show that true satisfaction is to be found in life, but there are conditions. And at the end, I'll have a brief look at what Paul says to Timothy uh, to make just a little headway into how we might meet those conditions. And so to begin, I'll uh, just talk about a little bit of background from chapter 5. And this is where Jesus had to deal with a group of Jews who were complaining bitterly because he had healed the lame man who was laying next to the healing waters of the pool. Now, they weren't actually complaining because he healed the man, but because Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. And so in that chapter, John records that Jesus took the time and the effort to explain to them that the core of their problem um, was not accepting him, was their inability to believe in who he was. And so he used their, the three core people in their scriptures. Um, th there was God and there was Moses and there was even John the Baptist. And he explained to them in that way to help them to understand what was happening, 
to show them that each of these three all pointed to him. He was very patient and clear and he used what they already knew and understood the way any good teacher does. And that's the sort of method that he uses all the way through chapter 6. He shows them, then the people complain, then he, then he patiently explains and then he goes around again and a bit more strongly the next time and a bit more thoroughly each time. So as we begin chapter 6, Jesus is coming from Jerusalem and he crosses the Sea of Galilee and he wants to spend some time with his disciples. But a very large crowd followed him and they began to gather. And it really was a very large crowd. John tells us there were about 5,000 men, but they had their families with them. And so with all those women and children, it's not unreasonable to think there could have been about 20,000 people or more. So it's no wonder the disciples felt a bit overwhelmed with the size of the job of getting them fed. Let's have a look from verse 5. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where are we going to buy bread for all of these people to eat? And he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two fish, two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? And Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. Hang on. What? As much as they wanted, it really was a big crowd. It says they had as much as they wanted. Sometimes we make quite a lot of asking God for what we need and not for what we want. These had as much as they wanted. And you have to admit, it's a very satisfying thing to have as much as you want. And that's actually what satisfied means. It means to be filled up, to be completed. We talk about a debt being satisfied when it's completely paid out. Not when it's only going to take another 12 months. That's okay. But when it's completely paid out, it's satisfied. Now, I don't doubt that those people had many needs, many empty places in their lives, but the first thing that Jesus did was with this crowd was to feed them, and they had as much as they wanted, and they were satisfied. Last week, I went and picked Elijah up from school, and he was out of sorts. He didn't want to come home with me. He wanted to go to after-school care, but he had to because there's a mistake his mother had made. And he dragged his feet and he said rude things to his nana. And we got home eventually. And the first thing that I did was give him a drink of water, which went down the hatch like that. And then he had two wheat bix, And then he had two pikelets and a drink of milk. And then he had an apple. And then, us, then he sat him down and I said, what happened at school today? And with all the energetic passion of a six-year-old, he told me all the annoying things. He says annoying. All the annoying things that happened at school today. And so it's really important that people are fed first. It's hard to hear if you're starving hungry. And it could seem a bit trivial, I suppose, for those of us who've never had a hungry, a truly hungry moment in our lives to focus on our physical need for bread. But for those who have to work hard to get food into their mouths or those of their children, and that's most of the world's people, or many anyway, of the world's people, people, um, a deeper need than bread or, you know, or rice or taro or potatoes or whatever, it's hard to imagine. And for many of us, the closest we get to being hungry is voluntary hunger, a fasting time. Now, Fasting and starving are definitely two different things, but with both of them, I'm told, what would I know? Both of them, I'm told that there's a time of getting beyond feeling hungry. Some of us might know about that, but I know that, oh, well, I've heard that after two or three days of no food, the hunger pangs fade somewhat. 
but they do come right back. You know, for those who are really starving, well, it's a bit distressing, you know. We've all seen, well, very distressing. We've all seen those terrible pictures on TV of little children with bloated stomachs. And we've heard the tragic stories of people eating anything at all to get something into their stomachs, grass or mud or some such. And we don't have that in this country, except in a terrible way, we do. We really do, not physically, but spiritually. And it can work the same way. If our spirits are starved, if they're shriveled, we'll fill it with anything, our stuff, our busyness, our ambition, our competitiveness, and all these serve to fill the gap for a very short time. And it's even worse for some who turn to drugs and promiscuity and violence and those sorts of things, all to fill that gaping gap inside. And it doesn't do it because that gap is God-shaped. Nothing else can fit and nothing else can satisfy. And those things might feel like it just for a time, but they're never fully satisfied with those things. And I have gone ahead a bit. I do want to get back to the 5,000 5, or however many. And so Jesus got the disciples to sit the people down. He prayed and the food was distributed and everyone had as much as they wanted and they gathered up the leftovers and there was no waste. Now those who had been fed and had seen what Jesus had done got some ideas in their head. And they said the right words. They said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Because they had a hope in their hearts that this miracle meant what they thought they wanted it to mean. But they didn't understand that their plan was not Jesus' plan. Their motives weren't right, and verse 15 tells us that Jesus knew that, and so he left to be alone. The physical is important, and it has to be first, but there's more. There's always more. And Jesus' plan was not to leave it at that. And so evening came. And the disciples got into their boat to go back to Capernaum. And next in, in John's Gospel, there's the story about Jesus walking on the water. And, and for today, it's for another day. I'm going to skip that now and move on to the next day. Where you can just imagine how the news of what happened had travelled. The people who'd been fed and the people who'd heard about those who had been fed went to the place where it had happened to try to find Jesus, and he wasn't there. And so they got into their boats and they crossed over the sea to Capernaum. They were persistent and they found him. Well, they were wanting something. They were wanting to see something else amazing happen or to get more free food maybe. And what they got was not what they expected. Jesus begins to challenge them. And straight away he goes to the deeper issue. He says, you only came after me because your bellies were filled and you were satisfied. Well, really, I would have thought that was a pretty good reason. But, <laughs> but let's see what he says. Verse 27. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And then they asked him, what must we do to do the works that God requires? And Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Now, not only was Jesus not doing what they had come for, but he was telling them something that went entirely against the grain. These people have only ever known the law, doing this, this way, doing that, that way, in order to keep God's law, in order to please God. And Jesus says, the work of God is to have faith because his plan is to take them into deeper and, in, and into the more essential parts of gaining true satisfaction. He's going past the food and the satisfaction of their bellies and onto their deeper need. And he says, their faith must be in him. Well, we can see that they're not up to that part yet because they go straight back to what they think they want. And they say, well, how about giving us a sign? 
so that we can believe. That's what we came here for, after all. And they remind Jesus, you know what Moses did. He gave them the manna bread from heaven. They still want to see something unusual or exciting or amazing and probably free food. (laughs) But Jesus, on his teaching cycle, he gently and insistently again turns them away from their bellies and toward their hearts, from the physical to the spiritual. The physical is very important, but there's more. There's much more. There's always more. And he says, you're wrong. The manna bread didn't come from heaven. It's only my Father God who gives the true bread from heaven. Verse 35, let's read. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. And now in the next few verses, he takes time to carefully explain the connection between their spread of heaven and the faith in him that they need. And what happens? They complain bitterly. Verse 41, at this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Grumble, grumble. I wonder, have you ever asked God for his provision, got his provision, and then started grumbling? Many years ago, long, long time ago, I had a little shop in Ipswich, a small business, and the Ipswich Centre Plaza was going to be remodelled, and so I had to choose whether I wanted a new shop in there or whether I wanted to take a different direction. And so I had a bit of time off, and I um, did the adult entrance exam for university, and um, after a while I applied to go to university, and when you apply, Um, whether you're a young person or as a mature age student like me, you have to make six choices when you apply. And my first choice was social work, because I was a bit stupid in those days. And (laughs) Sorry, social workers. (laughs) And and teaching was, was... pretty much halfway down. And so when, when the paper, in, the, in those days you used to get the paper with all the choices in, and so when the paper came, got up very, very early in the morning to get the paper, I was, I, there was my name, I had got into university. But it was not what I had chosen, it was not my first choice. And the, and the, and the disappointment was, oh, it was terrible. I grumble, grumble, <laughs> grumble, grumble. And so I said, well, I'll go. How nice of me. (laughs) I'll go and I'll do the first semester and then I'll swap across to what I want, grumble, grumble. (laughs) And after about three months at university or or a much shorter time than first semester, I managed to work out that God knew far more about me and my my future direction than I ever had and I've been a teacher ever since. (laughs) Grumble, grumble. (laughs) So (laughs) Jesus says, stop grumbling. (laughs) In verse 43, sorry, and again he goes on to explain the way to true satisfaction. And this is such a clear explanation for those who have ears to hear. And here's a big hint for you. When Jesus says, very truly, it's code for something along the lines of, I'm about to give you an important, never-changing truth and you should listen carefully. Verse 47, very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. Whoever believes has eternal life. There's absolutely nothing like having the eternal life of Jesus in our spirits to give complete satisfaction. This is the real deal, eternal life in the perfect presence of our Father God. This is the eternal life that we were created for. And there's such a hunger 
for a relationship with God, for this, lo- for this sort of life in this world. And it comes out in the dissatisfaction that we see everywhere. I've already said people look for it in the strangest corners. There are even those who think that technology will one day be the source of eternal life. Oh my goodness, that, uh, that AI, artificial intelligence, will become more intelligent than people and supersede humans. Those, there are people who get their bodies and brains frozen and hope to come back in those horrible old things. You have to wonder, don't you, about the desperation in some people's souls. There are science fiction movies about such things and they really need to stay in the movies, but they don't. There truly are branches of science and technology exploring and working hard and spending much money on developing them. And it's because of the hunger, the deep, deep hunger in the human soul for eternal life. In those old New Testament times, when people were looking in all the wrong corners, and they were pointed to Jesus, they got defensive and angry. But Jesus did not hold back. He did not water down his wonderful message. Verse 51 again. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And we have to admit, I suppose, that this is a tricky part of Jesus' teaching about the bread of life. We refer to it so often in communion with great gratitude that we don't even think it's difficult or strange that Jesus would speak very straightforwardly about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And in those next verses, he explains that his very body and blood, his very person, is the food and drink that provides the eternal life that's our complete satisfaction. Here's a little bit more, verse 57. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live forever. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And Jesus knew that there were many people who were not ready to hear such depths of truth. He knew that many couldn't hear it at all and maybe never would be able to, but he taught them anyway. And some heard and gained eternal life, even when Jesus was standing right there in front of them, telling them the truth. Many people couldn't hear, and some of his followers even left. But Jesus knew all these things. He must have been so sad about that, but he didn't let his sadness stop him speaking the truth. He didn't let that rejection of him stop him speaking the truth. And nothing has changed for us. That deep hunger of lack of satisfaction in our world hasn't changed, and the angry, defensive reaction to being offered Jesus really hasn't changed. And there could be times for us when we have to take a stand at home or in our workplaces and we have to speak what we know to be the truth, even though we know it's going to be rejected, even though we ourselves might be rejected because some might hear and gain eternal life. In verse 64, Jesus said, But there are some of you who do not believe, for he knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe, and who would betray him. And he said to the twelve, do you want to leave too? What a thing to say to those that he loved so much. Do you want to leave too? I wonder how he was feeling just at that moment. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And that's what we're like too, indeed. Where would we go? Life and living for us is all about Jesus. He is the bread of life, a life that offers satisfaction beyond anything this world can possibly offer. And then for eternity. Now that sounds like the end of our problems, but it isn't. We Christians have a taste of that eternity right here, right now. And that's the life of the Holy Spirit in us. And that's so good, we can't really imagine how good it's going to be later. And there's much more waiting for us. But our problem is that until then, the world keeps 
pulling us away and it'll never stop, pulls us away like a magnet. Paul understood this very well and he had great concern for his young converts and so he wrote to Timothy. And this is chapter 2 in Timothy, um, um, in 2 Timothy, verses 1 to 7 and this is pretty much what Wendy was singing about this morning. So Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 1 to 7. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hard-working farmer should be the first to receive the share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Have you ever used avoidance strategies to delay doing a job that needs to be done? I know when I was at university, mature age students had the cleanest houses of anywhere because you do anything to avoid writing an assignment. I think I've heard that university students get assignments written for them now. <laughs> Maybe some do. Um, so we used to get pulled away from the task by the dusting. <laughs> That's a bit, a bit gross. Paul's concerned about that sort of thing for Timothy. He sees it as getting pulled away by the worries and the demands and the attractions of worldly things. And he uses the three examples that were very well known in their culture. And he says soldiers keep their focus on their soldiering and athletes keep their minds on their training. And farmers look to their crops because that's where each of them gets their reward. And now Timothy needs to keep his attention on the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And so do we. That's Paul's encouragement for us as well. This world is full of things to enjoy and it certainly doesn't mean that our lives are to, are to lack ordinary enjoyment like good food and good company and music and concerts and holidays. And those things are all rewarding to some degree but they are not to be our focus. We're like Timothy. We've been given a job and it's a marvellous job. It's a great privilege to be given that job. We've been trusted with the truth of eternal life and it's the most revolutionary message ever heard and we're not to water down the strong bits to make it more acceptable. We're not to rub off the prickly bits if we're to teach and to demonstrate to the next generations that it's Jesus and only Jesus who is the true bread of life. That's the only message in our dark world that gives full and complete satisfaction. And until now, we've been mostly pretty sheltered from the consequences of speaking out that message. Other countries and other generations have had it worse. Maybe we'll continue to be sheltered in the future and maybe not. But we do know that his truth will never fail us. And to finish, I have two quotes that I know you'll love. The first one is Psalm 37. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. I know you love that one. And a quote from N.T. Wright because he's a favourite favorite author as well. And he says... Life will never be easy for those who live and preach the gospel, but with scripture in their heads and their hearts, they will be able not only to hold on, but to grow in faith themselves and to teach others also. Let's pray. Now, Father, we do ask that you will come by your spirit right now and seal your message to our hearts. Lord, we are indeed your people. And we do, we do, we do declare that we are your people in truth and in power. And we do want to pass your message on to whoever will listen to whoever that, that you prepare who can hear and especially in the next generations. And we ask your blessing on us for that purpose. In the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless.